Welcome to Adopting Zero Trust, an independent podcast. Our hosts, Elliot Volkman and Neil Dennis, will have transparent and open conversations with the people driving modern security approaches forward while leaving vendor hype behind. It's time to remove implicit trust and buzzwords and get to the root of the movement. Hello and welcome back to Adopting Zero Trust or AZT. I'm Elliot Volkman, your producer, alongside Mr. Neil Dennis, your host, the guy who actually knows what most of this is actually about. And today we're going to be revisiting something that, even though it's not necessarily in the largest of headlines, still in some headlines, is still an issue. It's a pretty common thing that we see for most vulnerabilities and issues, but fortunately we have an expert who recently released a report on that situation who's gonna be able to walk us through that. And of course, what I'm alluding to is the lovely Log4j situation, which has never really gone away. Fortunately, we have a time mayor from Cato Networks, who I believe uh, is the chief cybersecurity strategist now. And you are part of the recently released report that reevaluates and gets a pulse check on the current state of Log4j and how it's impacting organizations. Before we get necessarily to the report itself and some of the findings that you have, hopefully most of our listeners are very intimately familiar with that situation and the patching and the vulnerabilities associated with it. But maybe you can give us a little bit of a history lesson and a reboot of why it was an issue, you know, several years back, and then we can kind of pick it up to current day. Sure. So first of all, thank you for uh, having me on. So the log4j vulnerability was identified in December, I believe, three years ago, roughly December 11th, if I remember correctly. And one of the main reasons that it is such a big issue is because this is a, lo a software library that is integrated into many different solutions. And so in many cases, organizations don't even know that they're vulnerable to this specific export because it may be nested within a software that they purchased or is used by you know, a third party that is in their systems. So it's hard, very hard to identify all the vulnerable systems. And the number two is, you know, number one, it's, it's, there's a vulnerability. Number two, it's super popular. It's everywhere. So the combination is kind of a, a lethal mix in terms of vulnerabilities and exports. So I'm curious from your perspective, since this is a nested issue and it requires a certain level of maturity and you know knowledge from the organization who owns the library itself, from your perspective, typically where is that vulnerability or issue flagged? Does it come, is it like a two-way street? So the owner of the library will hopefully be the one to identify it, patch it and update it to the current version? Or is it like a third party and we have like supply issues, supply chain issues involved? Where, where does that usually originate? So if we're talking broadly about vulnerable software, you know, first of all, I wish there were no issues, but if there are, that the person who created that, that software would actually alert and uh, patch it. You know, when you think about it though, a lot of times these things tend to come up in, in the context of a breach. And when you talk about a breach, there's usually only three ways that a breach gets detected. It's either you detected, either somebody told you about it, mostly like law enforcement probably. And number three is the criminal or the attack group tell you that, hey, you've just been ransomed to give us the money. So those are the three. And unfortunately, we see it in the other way around, right? Mostly it's the third option and then the second option and then the first option in terms of how likely are they to happen. So... With that in mind and that lens, it sounds like it's a pretty reactive function, which brings us to the current state and the report that this is still impacting organizations. If there's not really a whole lot of attention being raised, this report obviously helps bring that back into the limelight. You know, how are you seeing organizations trying to deal with it today? Or is it just kind of neglected? What What is essentially contained in the report that's identifying? Is there an increase in exploitation of it? Yeah, maybe give us a little bit of a rundown of what the current state is. Sure. So a little bit of background. So the report we're referencing is the Cato 2024 Q2 uh, Threats Report, which we released. And we look into a lot of different topics in these in the report, the quarterly report. One of the topics is indeed uh, the most vulnerable, the most exploited vulnerabilities uh, that we see out there. We Cato, uh, who, for those who don't know, a SASE provider, the leader, uh, according to the Magic Quadrant. We have over 2,500 customers. So we look into the networks and see what is really happening on these networks. What are threat actors really trying to do? The reason I'm emphasizing this is there's a lot of discussions about zero days and the number of vulnerabilities that you can protect from. 
And don't get me wrong. I mean, you say zero day, I won't shut up for about two hours. I love talking about these things. But I'm trying to look the truth in the eye and see what is actually being done. And I was shocked to see that the top 10, and actually even more, we only talk about the top 10 in the report, vulnerabilities being exploited are not very new. Uh, they're pretty old ones. Uh, I mean, Log4j is three years old, but I've, I mean, I've seen vulnerabilities that, that are seven years old, 10 years old. The threat actors still try to exploit. Why? Because it works apparently for them, For you know. And then we have to ask ourselves, why does it still work? And what should we, what should we focus on? And unfortunately, again, uh, Log4j is one of those vulnerabilities along with several others that are harder to find and harder to patch because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to come off, you know, hey, tie the security guy says, secure everything and you'll be fine. Yeah, it's really easy to say that, but the reality is it's not easy to identify. Some systems are even hard to patch, even if you know that they're vulnerable, if you're thinking about critical systems, right? And if you patch them and something breaks along the way and, you know, systems go down. So that's that's another kind of like risk. So there's, there's a lot of issues around uh, the identification, but then also... What do you do about it? The fun part about this is, you know, you're spot on, right? On the respect to the, the efficacy of old things related to threat actors and what they're wanting to do. I always find these reports fascinating for that fact alone. They obviously would not put them in there if they're not still getting some kind of success, right? Because some of those things could potentially kick off alerts and certain security stacks that would keep them from being able to go further with other stuff. So for them, the winds are still there relative to that exploitation path. So they're obviously still using it. And the other fun part of this with Logforge that you're talking about, the whole SBOM piece, I'm hoping we can kind of go down that rabbit hole a little bit as we get through this. But on that note, you know, is this, I, I'm just for clarity up here for everybody listening. Are you seeing Logforge as like the number one, even though it's still in the top 10, but is it up there in the top five kind of exploitation attempt paths? Is it down at number 10? Have we seen it go up and down a little bit or, you know, what, what's the historical path that you've seen? Is it like top of the tier or is it starting to kind of wane a little bit? I mean, it's still top of the tier. Uh, you will get, get occasional spikes if there's a new vulnerability that, you know, a lot of threat actors will want to use, they'll just put it into their scanners, they'll put it into their systems and try to uh, find the vulnerable systems to exploit them. But this is like the, you know, those, the, the sad but true from Metallica, like it's been uh, in the charts for forever. It's not going anywhere. Same here. It's, and, and here it's still top, top of the chart. It is still up there. Again, going back to that kind of lethal combination of super popular, hard to patch, hard, hard to catch in some, in some instances. And yeah, the threat actors are relentless. I mean, we still read about different, unfortunately, a lot of them are, are ransomware attacks that are using this specific vulnerability in order to, you know, do, do their thing, so to speak. And I think it also speaks to when we talk about these, these breaches, about the fact that we need to pay attention to the entire security stack. Uh, one of my kind of like pet peeves when we talk about security is you read these articles and they say, you know, company X was breached because of vulnerability. Company Y was breached because of password. Pro company Z was breached because of, I don't know, misconfigured firewall. But it's, it's never just one thing. It's never just, oh, we were vulnerable for a log for J and that's it. Because, okay, that's how they got in. But what happened after that? How come they weren't detected on the network? How come when they downloaded the payload that wasn't identified, when it was exposed on the network, why was that not identified? You know, one of the things I really don't like is the saying that the attacker needs to be right just once. The defender needs to be right all the time. The attacker needs to be right a lot of times. And we should pay attention to the initial access, but also there's a lot of other opportunities in, in there to also identify the breach that started with this vulnerability. Yeah, I think I'm going to go back on a few other things here in a moment, but I think the exploitation path is a very fair call out. You're right. Um, there are plenty of steps beyond initial exploitation where you could have mitigated the larger threat. And a lot of people tend to forget about that. Now, hence this podcast. This is part of the uh, discussions we've had and like to have is why zero trust as a construct is, you know, potentially important for implementation because just because I get one server doesn't mean I should be able to get everything, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, Log4j, Apache server base, once you get through that, most people still have that backdoor wide open with no other gateways in play, right? 
And just to iterate on this, I, I think that's part of why LogForge is such an issue. Aside from its persistence, it's obviously because of where it's stationed, what makes it so popular, and what you're taking advantage of. You know, this is a server side exploit that 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 toolkit is, like you mentioned, exceedingly persistent in almost every version of Apache that you could ever hope for. And then other things. So that's the other part. People look at it from the Apache server space, but there's other ways to get through. When you think about this exploitation path, when you think about LogForge and other stuff like this, these long-term persistent exploits, what are, what are some of the things that people need to really maybe put resources towards other than, than blatant mitigation of LogForge, but what are some ideas on how to find this or, or what should they be considering from a resource perspective to actually take care of this and maybe some of those other persistent things? So one of the methodologies that I personally am a huge advocate of is virtual patching. And for those who are not familiar with virtual patching, there's some really good OWASP articles that define it and explain how it's being done. But virtual patching is the action of protecting against the exploitation without necessarily patching the actual vulnerability. So what you're actually doing is you're identifying the attack that the attackers are taking or the exploitation that the attackers are trying to perform, and you're stopping that. Essentially, you're putting like this protective shield around your, your network. So while you are still vulnerable, and it's very important for me to, to emphasize this, you may still be unpatched. You're not letting the attack in. And that is something that I think is, is a great approach because, again, it, it allows the, the, the target of the, of the attack, in this case, to take their time, identify the vulnerabilities, identify how to patch them, not break stuff, test it, and so on, knowing that they are protected from the actual vulnerability, from the actual exploitation. Just for the sake of the example, that's exactly, you know, that's, that's what we did with this. Within 17 hours and 40 minutes, if I remember correctly, from the point that it was released, our customer, it was an on issue for our customers. And, and it really hurts me because, you know, we were talking about this before. I mean, you see literally on a daily basis, you see exploitation of this with something that could have been uh, avoided. So that's, that's an area that, that's one area that I think is very important, virtual patching. The other area is really something that I mentioned before, and that is focus on the exploits that matter and not the latest and greatest, not just the numbers or, or even the most recent. Look, at the end of the day, there's only so many organizations with limitless resources. It's like the top five banks, right? Everyone else has some limitations and they need to focus. And as much as I, I like working and talking with the large organizations, you also have to keep in mind the very small ones, the ones where the IT guy is the, the guy who does the, the, the firewalls and the tickets and, you know, it's all on that one person that runs a small shop. And so while I would like you to have be able to do everything, it's it's not practically possible. So focus on the ones that, that really matter and don't just go with solutions or approaches that say, hey, we have 10 million vulnerabilities that we are, you know, whatever ludicrous numbers. Yeah, but the ones that are important to me, the ones that I have, the ones that the attackers are using, show me those. Yeah, I think prioritization is a big thing for a lot of companies, like you mentioned. You're right. Having worked on that side more often than not, the latest and greatest flavor of the day comes out and leadership is, oh my God, have we patched this? It's not even in our environment. Why are you calling me at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning? Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're not. You just read a news article and you bought into the doom and gloom speech by some vendor who said they could fix it. Thanks. With that in mind, knowing your environment, right, is critical. And... The smaller companies like you're referencing, you know, I, I would say personally the if you're in the Fortune 2500, give or take a little bit, you should be able to afford some modicum of SBOM approach and, and resource management and control on that. Maybe not full efficacy, because I also saw a stat a while back that the average enterprise agency has somewhere north of around 1,200 various vendor type solutions within their larger corporate environment, whether that's a simple software suite on a laptop, whether that's an actual log forge enabled Apache server, things like that, but some 1200 plus vendor related products minimum within their stack of IT. So understanding the entire SBOM of all of those is probably never going to happen even for the fortune, you know, 50. But I say all that because back on SBOM, I, I think having the right relationships as a small company with the companies that you're attached to that are way larger than you 
and letting them know that you're part of their exploitation path, especially if you're providing a service, might help you get some more credit and clout downrange for them to help you, maybe even a little bit. So from an SBOM perspective, do you think that there's ways to, to drive that home? Do you think that would be an effective approach specific for these types of exploitations? And do you think it's worth the energy to create an SBOM if you're a smaller company or request SBOMs from those vendors at large and spend all that resource around all of this? I'll start from the end. I, I'm not sure that it is, I, I don't know how small companies would do that with that. So it's such a, it's such a deliberate and such a heavy process to do. If I'm honest, the large organizations are having some issues with, with doing S bomb as you know, as you'd want them. And there's a lot of discussions around what is the proper way to do it? And how do you handle this, this process? Actually, uh, one of the things that I do uh, is I'm also part of the RSA conference committee. And I can tell you, we, we talk about that a lot when we receive presentations and, and that's one of the topics we, we, we want to discuss, but it's, it's not an easy discussion. And just to make, make things even more difficult, you touched upon a topic that I, I really think is important. And that is, you said that know your net, do you know your network? Do you even know your environment? And, you know, I come from the world of, of doing uh, adversary simulation, uh, attack simulation and, and breach preparedness. And I, I used to tell CISOs, and this this happened a lot, you know, if I ask a CISO or an IT manager, what does your network look like? I know what I'm going to get. I'm going to get this this visual file and I'll see all the routers and everything would have the nice lines and everything would be organized and really nice. But then if you ask a red teamer, what does that environment look like? Hopefully a red teamer, not the, the threat actor. And I said, oh, well, there's this, you know, unmanaged router that I saw that somebody installed in the office, or I saw this user that somebody didn't close when the person left the organization. Those are my way in and you'll never see them. So do you really know your environment? And one of the topics that I touch upon in the, in the report that I mentioned before is also which applications are running in your own environment. And I, I want to give two examples, if that's okay. Last year, I was actually shocked when I did the, the review of the whole of, of last year, I was looking at about. 1500 different applications that we were monitoring on customer networks and the top five would be the ones you'd expect, you know, Microsoft, Google stuff, but then number 23 on the list in terms of amount of network traffic was TikTok. I was like, on corporate networks, what is that doing there? Now, without even going to the discussion, whether is TikTok a malware by some government or is it a legitimate, you know, are you happy that this is on your network? Are you aware of the of the, the problems this might cause and privacy security issues. And I'm seeing the same thing now again, because I specifically looked in this report into, and I don't mean to derail this conversation, but I will mention this. I looked into what is now referred to as shadow AI, right? AI applications, hundreds of AI based applications. And again, are you familiar with these things that are running on your corporate network? A lot of them are like health trackers and kids stuff that kids use. And, and now you're talking about all kinds of issues. So do you really, and going back to your, going back now to what we started talking is, do you really know your network? Do you understand what is going on there? And that's, that's a tough, that's, that's a tough question that I feel is getting even tougher because I mean, you know, this 15, 20 years ago, it was, oh, I have my perimeter. You come into my office. I can control everything. I have everything inside my perimeter. Everything is, is I can see it. Now you have remote users and cloud applications and, and third parties and, ev and you are inheriting their their security posture and you're responsible without being able to fully control it. Yeah. I will say that, that this is a very relevant part of this topic, in my opinion. Um, I log for just still there because people don't know what the hell's going on in their, in their networks the right way. And I also want to put a line in the road, SBOM versus network awareness and resource awareness, two different things. And at the end of the day, you need one to get to the other technically. And the other one gets you a lot more, but S bomb massive workload. And this is why I was asking about it because I think, I think it's important for critical resources at your, at your company to understand what the S bomb is for very critical things to you. So whatever your risk profile is, if, if an Apache server is what's keeping your website live and keeping the dollars rolling in for your PayPal payments or whatever it is you're using. You should probably know everything you can about that entire solution, SBOM-wise. 
if it's a, a website that people use to come and look at your latest and greatest news, but it's only getting hits once a week, probably doesn't matter as long as it's not connected. As long as you know that it's Apache, and when someone mentions Apache, you know to go look, but you don't need to know the full suite until it becomes problematic. So awareness of what's there versus SBOM for those listening, big differences. Knowing your environment versus knowing the SBOM. Know your environment at the very least. Know what's actually hanging out out there. And then back to your point about network awareness and the infrastructure. I want to go down that one because I love this stuff. The tools, the AI, all the fun things we're bringing from home with us. And you're right. It used to be as simple as put up some kind of DNS resolution and people who were smart enough to practice uh, loud list versus you know, blacklist, deny list, things like that. I think that's where people need to get going to again. And once again, back on zero trust. I, I should not be allowing people to connect to my network and have every single one of their apps also be able to connect through that network. If I've got the right DNS resolvers and some other things in play, that phone should only be talking to my Outlook server at that point and whatever else is required for work if you're doing your job right. So I just want to iterate your points on that, because I, I do think it's critical and difficult. So know thyself, right? Yeah. And, and, and when we have these discussions with organizations, you know, I'll, I'll give an example that I, I, I used, I used to show all kinds of, you know, gadgets, you know, the rubber duckies of the world and how to use them. One thing that I didn't like when I used to do these demonstrations is you'd show like a, a rubber ducky to an organization, say a mid-sized organization. And they're like, okay, no more USBs in our company. That thing is scary. No more USBs. I'm like, that's not what I really meant because you have to be very careful when you block, completely block stuff. All of a sudden, everybody becomes a hacker. And what you'll see next is you'll probably see presentations and corporate stuff on Gmail going to drives that you're not familiar with. And I see you're laughing. And you're like, you know where, where, where this is going. And and so the, the, the approach to it can be kind of a multi-tiered approach of, okay, what do we do with all these different applications? And I look at it and say, okay, um, you could go with a complete blacklisting, right? Let's take the example of an, I don't know, whatever, a, a, an AI tool. And you can say, okay, yes or no, I want it or I don't want it on my network, on my, you know, allow it on my network. And then you can go and level down and you can say, you know what, I'm not going to block, let's say, chat GPT, right? I'm going to allow you, but I'm only going to allow you using, you know, a corporate user, not your private user, because that one I can monitor and I can control a little bit better. So that might be a choice. And then you can go down another level. You can say, you know what, I, I'll allow you to use this application. I allow you to use your own user, but there are certain actions that I'm not going to allow you. For example, uploading files. That's, that's too risky from our network. And then you can go another level down, you know, I'll allow you to use that, that application. I'll allow you to use your own user. I'll allow you to upload files. But you can't upload files that contain, you know, HIPAA information or PCI DSS information. So you're going into kind of like the DLP space. But organizations, they can, they can, they have, there's controls that you can use to kind of decide where, where is either your, depends how you look at it, your level of comfort or what is your risk appetite, you know, with these different applications. But it goes back to the same point that you mentioned before. You have to know that these things are there to even start that discussion. Yeah. I think this day and age with the BYOB and BYOD piece, especially as corporate life gets back into the office space post, you know, all this other fun stuff, the, the individuals, myself included, if you put me back in an actual office space, I'm just going to be just as bad when I'm sitting at home looking at my damn phone when I don't have a meeting, but understanding that current user base needs that type of access, right? Or to your point, they'll find ways to do it that aren't going to be gated the right way. And I am just as guilty as the next one for all this stuff. If you can't give me some kind of public drive in whatever service we're using, I'm going to go start up my own Gmail account and do that if that's what I need to get my stuff to my client base, right? The one thing I like, and we did this in the military even back in the early 2000s, when internet cafes were still kind of a thing, and you would have all of your normal network space. We didn't have to worry about cell phones. They weren't allowed where I worked, working in skiffs and stuff. But they knew that people still needed to connect to the dot-com world. And so they started standing up these little small internet cafe type things on in our facilities. And so you'd go out of your secure space into another space. And that network that you were logging into wasn't the actual unclassed network. It was a segregated, just go do internet things network, holistic gateway, holistic security policy and protocol. Now, I do see this at some enterprises today where they purposely do that, right? So they gatekeep what they need to gatekeep. They put in these different echelons like you're talking about to give people some flavors. And then they say, you know what? At the end of the day, 
here's, here's this unrestricted or somewhat less restricted public Wi-Fi space for you to log in through and go do your TikToks to your heart content with your own private stuff. And then they block access through corporate layer on that. Yep. So I think that's the thing people need to remember. If you're having your employees come back, especially post COVID stuff, that phone is not going anywhere. And their desire to do their TikToks and their other fun stuff at work is not going to go anywhere. And then that brings you back to the exploit path. How do you control it without them becoming little hallway hackers? Uh, you, you brought back some memories. I think we might have some similar background in terms of military. You, we would secure these facilities and then you'd have an officer come in with like a, like a Fitbit or something on their chest oh, and they're like is... running around the base or doing whatever and like, Dude, uh, this is supposed to be, you know. <laughs> oh my God, I remember those. That was a fun one to read about with the uh, overseas places where they were doing the um, yeah Strava, Strava um, heat heat yeah. maps and stuff like that. And by the way, see, this is another another thing. So it's it was in the news about eight years ago, and then I read about it again uh, three, two or years ago. I'm like, Did, didn't that happen like almost a decade ago? How didn't you read the article? Yeah. Well, so once again, talking about your exploitation footprint, and I'm going to wrap myself out here. Uh, bought a watch that at the time was probably the, had the highest battery life and performance ratio for, for those, those fitness things called a Koros brand. This is not me saying go buy Koros. This is me saying don't, even though I still have mine. The watch performed beautifully for those looking. And my advert link will be down here in a little bit. No, but I didn't realize, I didn't do a whole lot of research into the company. A lot of athletes that I was looking at, and this goes back to why people are doing TikToks and exploitation path. It's the weird things you don't think about until you have your guardrails up. I have guardrails here at my house. I have DNS with resolution. I have a bunch of other things. I have my own snort box. I have all these things. Paying attention to some of the lowbrow things because it's what you do when you have guests, kids, and other weird people using your internet. And I didn't realize that Koros itself is a Chinese company. I go in to look at my, my logs and I see all these, these resolution requests from my phone for the app out to China. All right. Out to Alibaba website or space server space. So I got worried for a few minutes. I went through and ripped apart everything on my phone. Cause I didn't realize it was that damn app because the referral link did not show that it was coming from the Coros app and I couldn't figure out what app was doing it. <laughs> and then once I figured it out, I ended up finding some good resolution on the websites and the or the URLs that it was trying to reference back to, but it was like eight layers deep. All that's there. People download weird things like that. People do stuff like that. And the only reason why I caught it is because I had the right guardrails. So that app doesn't exist on my phone. It exists solely as an actual watch. I don't use any of the apps that go with it. I don't touch it anymore. We can discuss why I don't like that other than China, but point is, I didn't know. And I wouldn't know unless I had the right guardrail, right? People bring stuff into your workspace like that all the time. And that footprint is massive, way more larger than people anticipate. And we are always playing catch up. And LogForge, back on that, is a great example. We don't know what's there because we don't have the resources or the time to go find it. Yeah, and I think yeah. uh, you did something very similar to what I did. I, did. I ran a practice at home. Of, I wanted to see how many Bluetooth devices I have at home. And I counted them. And I think I counted like 13 or 14 and I opened a Hacker One RF, uh, you know, the, one of those devices. I was so off. I didn't realize that my dishwasher had Bluetooth capabilities. I'm like, why does it have? Why does it even have that? By the way, a reverse of of what we we're talking about—not a reverse, but like consequences of different devices and vulnerabilities. A couple of years ago, I remember. I don't know if I remember this. They, they they had a problem with. I think it was an update to the Garmin. We we're talking about smartwatches to the Garmin watches. And the implications of that turns out that Garmin also provides maps to, to pilots. It's also the Air Force pilots have Garmin watches when they eject them. Okay, so we can't use that. So yeah. like the consequences of, of these things that we need, you know, we're talking about as well before, how do you factor in so many different elements into your operational, you know, uh, operational situation? Yeah. Now, I think back on the asset awareness and resource awareness. And for those who are listening that are fretting over SBOM and the fact that we keep mentioning you might be having a heart attack, I don't think either of us are saying that you need to go out and do SBOM. I think we're saying at the very least, though, you do need to expend resources knowing your base environment. So when something does happen, then you can go worry about the SBOM for that tool if you really, really have to. And this comes back to relationships and criticality. Like I mentioned earlier, 
if your risk profile says server A is more important than server B, you've probably already put some mitigation strategy and some monitoring strategy, hopefully around server A to help with whatever that risk is. And like Ty mentioned earlier, virtual patching. I love that. I think people don't realize how often that actually happens across all sorts of products. If you get behind all those and you, you start really hitting them directly, you'll find out most of your software providers have done exactly that for a large swath of things. Mitigations are there, the awareness is there, but the patches, the actual fixes to those vulnerabilities are not there because if they apply them, they break your entire tool stack. But it doesn't mean you're not protected. It just means that, that they've done a good job at monitoring for that, that issue and are stopping it before it gets there. And I think that's the key thing. S bombs are important for very specific things, but to, as best as possible, awareness about your environment is very, very critical when things like log, log forge kick off. And back to your report, people don't know they have Apache still. People still don't even realize that that's even a, a resource in their environment. And that's to me, is the real issue, is just that awareness factor. And, and, and if we want to take it a step, a step further, one of the things that kind of, I don't want to say I fear it, but it's something that I think is really worth looking into. A different vulnerability that was discussed actually this year, because a lot of times I'm being asked and talk about open source, you know, the X, XZ, where you had a threat actor that was willing to, to be there for two, three years in the system and wait until, you know, exploiting something like that. And I think we got really lucky with that. I think it was a, a Microsoft employee from Italy, if I remember correctly, like smart guy yeah. that actually identified. I was like, wow, we're so lucky. But now you have threat actors who are willing to say, really, this is the very, you know, slow, and, but, but cons cons consistent threat that's out there. Yeah, I, no, I, that, that's a very fair call. And thinking about your personal risk profile versus the risk profile of upstream and downstream products that you're attached to or, or enterprises you're attached to providing resources back. And this is something I try to drive home with everybody. If you are tied to someone else who is considered a possible target of any pick a flavor of APT in particular, congratulations, chances are you're also being looked at from an exploit perspective. And people will do that. Threat actors, you know, the, the tier one-ish APTs, mean time to dwell is years in most cases, well over a year, at least in many cases. And when you're looking at what's going on in your environment, if you're tied to, let's say, a Fortune 100 company as a primary resource, I guarantee you, you're being targeted especially if you're a critical asset for them, or at the very least, a direct vendor provider of some sort. And you've probably been pwned for years and they're just waiting to find that one critical exploit that gets them through your stuff into there, like SolarWinds. Uh, you know, SolarWinds is a prime example of that. Uh, I, you just thought, touched upon something that is very important for me because I think, you know, I look at these graphs and the, the, the dwell time, and I think those numbers are a little bit skewed. We talked about it bef at the beginning, right? That there are three ways to be, to identify you've been attacked. Either you identified, somebody tells you, or the threat actor tells you. And you look at the meantime, like people will say six months, eight months, I see the number going a little bit down and people are saying, oh, we're doing a better job. I don't think so, actually. I think a lot of the cases, uh, the ransomware group will tell you, hey, you've been ransomed. And then it's, oh, they've been six months. Yeah, but they could have stayed, like you said, two more years if they didn't let you know because they needed the money. They wanted to get the money. Yeah. And so the, the number is a little bit skewed because the threat actors are actually exposing themselves. It's not like we're exposing them. They're exposing themselves. That's why the, the mean uh, time is going down. And, yeah. and another topic that you mentioned that I think is very important is that now the discussions with, you know, we are, ta we are talking something super tactical, Log4j and how to identify the vulnerability. But CISOs today don't have, so to speak, the luxury of just doing tactical stuff. They have to be very strategic. And now you have the CISO who need to understand also geopolitical conflicts. Hey, there's a war between oh, this country yeah. and that country. The other country sees you as part of, of that stack, and now you're going to be a target because guess what? In war, it's tanks against tanks and fighters against fighters. In cybersecurity, it'll be a government versus, you know, that water facility or that bank or that private business. And and now you have to have that kind of view. You have to have a strategic and operational oh. and a tactical view. You can't just do one. Oh, I'm going to toot my own horn for about a half a sec. <laughs> I don't do this very often. Uh, usually Elliot's 
trying to do that for me because I self-deprecate too much. It's many, many moon ago, about seven, eight years ago, I wrote a couple of different articles on geopolitical situations and, and cyber exploitations. Some of them were, one of them was focused on Iranian exploitation with Shimon 2 and then eventually Shimon 3. And when that first kicked off, why it was very obvious that it was them before we knew it was them. Geopolitical situation said so very, very quickly and history said so. But more aptly, everybody got up in arms about, it was about seven, eight years ago when we had the, what was it, OPA breach, the government healthcare mm -hmm. and, and records piece. And then following that, we had forget which airlines, United and maybe, I think it was United and someone else had a massive breach perpetrated by Chinese APT as well, all within a couple of months, right? And everybody came out with saying, oh, they're doing that so they can track CIA and blah, 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 blah. And the funny part about this was if you actually looked at the larger geopolitical situation, you would realize that this isn't trying to focus on government accesses and trying to track someone with a clearance. It was focused on enterprise business commercial, private stuff that they were doing there. Cause in their five-year plan, they had stipulated that airlines and healthcare growth and a capability internal to them to match us and Europe for that scalability was one of their primary goals for that current five-year plan. They had crappy airlines. They had crappy global care systems. So what do they need to do? They need to learn how to set all that up. They go and exploit systems that show them how to set those databases up. And boom, they rinse, lather, repeat, and do what they do best, which is copy IP and do it for themselves. But everybody was so up in arms that now they're doing this to go out and make money and track everybody or whatever else. In reality, they're just doing it to support their own private business. So that, that awareness factor and that geopolitical situation, if people pay attention to the larger story, once again, helps you figure out if you are going to be a target. It helps you figure out if your tie-ins left, right, vertical, what you're doing, mean you're part of the exploitation path or part of the warpath piece being exploited simply for data or to get somewhere else. Or if someone's blatantly going to come to you because you are a critical asset, like a solar winds or a log forge and use you to cause global catastrophe. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I had a little bit of goosebumps because I was at, I worked at RSA when the RSA breached for those who remember happened a while back. At the time, uh, I think it's now. I think it's public knowledge now that the what was attacked was the secure ID number. Oh yeah. yeah, and that ended up with we weren't we were we were just part of the attack that actually was later used against Lockheed Martin. Just you know, the result of what happened to me 14 years ago is probably the J20 that we see today, Erica. And and, and now you are part of something that's even even bigger even bigger than that. And and by the way. This also reminded me of another kind of defining moment in my career. That was definitely a defining moment for me in, in cybersecurity. Another area was the understanding of what are your crown jewels? Because you mentioned, Neil, before, you know, hey, I identify that server that is important. I remember one of the things that kind of got me thinking about how to even identify the crown jewels uh, yeah. was the Sony breach where the most damage wasn't through like movies that were stolen or anything like that. It was the emails between the executives talking about the actors and how much they make. I like, I don't think in any simulation, bridge simulation, that would be identified as, hey, that's going to give us the most issues later. So it, it, it's, it's, it's definitely a tricky situation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I love this. The, as an Intel analyst, one of my biggest goals in an enterprise layer is to find out what the C-suite thinks is their risk profile. And each person at C-suite should have something slightly different to say. It all ties back to money, right? But it's from their perspective of what they think impacts the bottom dollar. And, you know, you go ask a, a CFO, you know, what they think is the big thing. And depending on how your CFO is aligned or if you have a CRO versus a, you know, depends on your financing setup, that CFO might be more fixated on just uptime and availability of whatever they're providing, if it's an IT company versus a physical product. But a resource officer might be more focused on actual, like the Sony breach might be more focused on how they're managing money with their third party accesses and things like that, maybe. It doesn't matter. But they're all going to have a little variation on what they say. And then as an Intel analyst, my job is to take those, those that risk profile that's defined by the board and senior leadership and figure out a way to turn that into requirements for my technical team downrange. 
So whether it's physical or digital related security issues that would get me as a threat actor to impact those risks that were discussed, I could turn those into a potential dollar value to go get resources for my security team. But to your point, you're never going to find it all. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where things like, for at least cyber, where things like MITRE attack framework come in hand, where you can say, you told me this was a risk, but I have absolutely no coverage for this column whatsoever. Don't. This is a soapbox moment. MITRE's great at fingerprinting threat actors, but that's not why it was created. Use it to identify what you're missing in your security procedures and policies and resources to help drive the rest of the requirement. So that, that is my Intel Analyst 101 speech for the day. Get requirements from your board of directors. They're never going to be right about everything, but at least you've got your ass covered for when they're wrong. It, um, it's funny right to this because uh, I, I teach a course here in Boston, uh, at Boston College on cybersecurity, and I teach the MITRE framework. And the case study that I use for MITRE framework is actually gap analysis. I ask the students, so take this, show me where your defense is, and then layer over the attacks and then start looking at, at the gaps. That's what you really want to pay attention to, you know, take, you think you're good. And here we're going back to that question. Oh, I might be targeted by an Iranian threat actor. Okay. So take uh, oil rig and the uh, uh, 34 or 36, I can't remember, put them together, see what are the common fingerprints, but then layer over that, the, the, the solutions that you have to understand where are the gaps that you need to, you know, look into before they look into it. Yeah. I mean, I don't, that's exactly why that framework was created. It's coincidental and and nice that you can use it to fingerprint a threat, but the idea is to fingerprint what you've done wrong. Yeah. Or what you haven't done yet. Yeah, that's a whole other fun topic about procedures and stuff like that, right? It's but, never complete. Sorry for stopping. That's why I think it's never sorry, complete. And one thing that I like is, is doing the, you know, you can use Caldera, Atomic Red Team, you know, start punching the holes into where you're not sure, you know, where you stand yeah. and, and take those micro procedures and, and, oh, you think you're protected from... WMI based, you know, okay, let's, let's run with that. Let's see, you know. Well, that gets us right back to know thyself, right? Like you mentioned, this is whether you're trying to map out risk and, and risk mitigation files and strategies for the things that you need to cover down on that you don't have resources through MITRE or whether you're just trying to figure out what the heck's on your environment, because part of that gets you to both sides of the coin. Yep. It comes back once again, the reason why LogForge is so popular still because people haven't had the chance or the resources to do exactly this. And next thing you know, someone gets in and ransomware, since that is still the massive flavor of the day for what most people are taking advantage of. And in my opinion, you're lucky if it's ransomware nowadays and just ransomware. Whatever they're doing from both, you know, legit ransom versus blackmail versus the rest of it, I I think if if a couple of million dollars worth of ransom is the least of your problems during an exploitation path nowadays, you're lucky because an APT legit state-sponsored threat could have taken advantage of the same thing and back to mean time to dwell and respond to all this other fun stuff. Been there for two, three years, sucking down IP and building the next J20, mm-hmm. right? And you not even know. And so I think double-edged sword, but we're fortunate that monetization of these exploits is so popular in the cybercrime world versus monetization at the moment through APT as a primary. Um, Because one, in my opinion, you lose a lot more money long-term than just getting ransomed. Yeah, there's brand awareness and all this other crap that happens when you get popped. But I would much rather say I had to pay a million dollar ransom than three years later say China's been sitting on my network for three years and lose all of my contracts and every work that I've been doing with anybody else up downstream. Yeah. I'm excited about yeah. it. <laughs> uh, so coming back around, final loop, the the log forge, best bomb versus just know thy self-awareness stuff, critical assets and features, all these things play into part of at least trying to keep yourself from being the next ransomware victim, the next APT target. But more aptly, I think paying attention to lists like y'all are providing specifically. I love seeing these lists. I love seeing the research that goes behind these um, when, when vendors and researchers provide this type of, of insight. Because if it's in that top 10, hell, if it's in the top 100, if people put out a more exhaustive list, every single thing on that list should be something I'm scanning for in my environment the moment that list hits. And if you're not, congratulations. It's probably there, especially these popular ones. And unless you know for a fact that you've already done a mitigation strategy against it, you should probably go look. Kind of my 
leftover two bits for that piece. Awesome. And yeah, I think, you know, what we try to cover in the report is, is, is the vulnerabilities, it's the applications, it's, it's, it's the know yourself. It's looking into the, the different protocols that, that you're using or, you know, another interesting thing that we saw there, for example, is inbound and outbound communication is uh, most, in most cases by most organizations is being encrypted. One bound communication is not. And so, okay, you might feel comfortable with your one bound, but so will the threat actor that will be in there if they get it. So that's an area to look into. So just a, a lot of different elements to, to look into that I think are, are interesting for organizations where you don't really realize, you know, what is really happening on your network. And we do yeah. this comparison, by the way, uh, in, in the large numbers. I mean, we analyze 1.38 trillion network flows for this quarter, uh, but we also do it for uh, different industries. So you can see trends over time for different industries and what, you know, what happens on that work. So just a, a lot of interesting points to, to look into there for those who are interested. All right. So that takes us to the end of our episode, the end of this conversation. But I have to say, and uh, I'm going to toot Neil's horn as he likes to call it out for me, is that I think, you know, we started on the topic of Log4j, but you all carried us down a few different strains that, frankly, we need to have more conversations about. First, I want to revisit the importance of organizations like yours who are able to identify issues that are still longstanding, still impactful. Yeah, we'll see some coverage in the trade magazines, but the only reason I'm seeing any coverage in the trade magazines are because folks like you are, of course, putting information out to the world to ensure that we have that. Thank you all, you all, to continue on that research and flagging and making it very clear that these are other issues. But some of these other things that Neil and I just haven't really dug into are things like the shadow AI, frankly, not even shadow IT part. Those are important pieces of the conversation. So I appreciate that you're able to elevate that too and knowing yourself and all that. But that said, I really appreciate you coming on, sharing a bit of your journey and your research and your information. I think that's super important for our listeners to be able to, again, revisit things that may have fallen off the radar and at least, you know, revisit some issues like Log4j. I think it was two, three episodes ago, we had similar issues that were just targeting small businesses. I think Log4j was on that list among others. But again, thank you so much for your advocacy and being part of this net, this system and community to, you know, help keep us all on our toes. Thank you very much for having me. You'll keep seeing more reports coming out, both strategic ones as well as tactical ones on threat actors and uh, the different exploitations that they utilize. We'll keep seeing more information, but thank you for having me on. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining AZT, an independent series. Your hosts have been Elliot Volkman and Neil Dennis. To learn more about Zero Trust, go to adoptingzerotrust.com. Subscribe to our newsletter or join our Slack community. Viewpoints expressed during the show do not reflect the brands, employers, or companies of our hosts, guests, or potential sponsors.